Hey everyone, and welcome to Tony for The Forces of Good and Evil. I mean, Tony for you. I've had a thought about alignment, and most likely, if you've played a good amount of games in the Shin Megami Tensei series, you've had this thought too. Most of the alignment endings in mainline SMT games are not that compelling, or at least heavily skewed for or against one side. Don't get me wrong, I love these games, and I am YouTube's number one law fan, but even I have to admit sometimes Atlas plays favorites depending on the games. It's interesting to note that this is a problem with mainline specifically, as almost all of the spin-off games that do alignment do it really well, like Devil Survivor or Raido 2. I dug a little deeper into this topic and wanted to make sure I wasn't crazy, so let's talk about each alignment ending in every mainline SMT game and see if they really do have clear biases. Starting with SMT1 and finally ending with the newest release in the series, SMT5. Needless to say, there will be spoilers ahead, so jump between the timestamps as necessary. The games discussed will be SMT 1, 2, 3, Strange Journey, 4, and 5. For the endings, we'll go in the order of Law, Chaos, Neutral, and then my final thoughts. SMT 1 Law is portrayed as a group of people, called Messians, subservient to Yahweh and aimed to establish the Thousand Year Kingdom to bring order to the world. After the bombs fell, demons began invading the world, and as a natural reaction, the people turned to a higher power whom can salvage some of what was lost. Understandably, many people are drawn to this as they seek safety and flock to a community of like-minded people. What's less amazing about the Messians is they are building a grand cathedral to serve as God's throne, and when it's built, a second great flood will wash over Tokyo and kill any who are unprepared or not inside the cathedral at the time. The portrayal of law is realistic, as in desperate times many would forsake personal freedoms in exchange for seemingly assured safety, and are willing to turn a blind eye to the most horrendous of crimes. The ending itself is hopeful, as a messenger of the messiahs congratulates you, but states there is still much to do and aims to gather any and all people who are left alive to be brought into God's kingdom in exchange for their faith, showing sincere care for those left behind and genuinely wanting to bring about paradise to all humans on earth, a world of happiness, law, security, and prosperity. All it costs is unwavering faith and living under God's iron fist. Chaos is difficult to pin down in SMT1, as most of the time, the Ring of Gaia is a cult of anarchists who aim to destroy any and all established order so that only the strong may survive. Power does not come from justice. Power is justice. That sort of thing. Sounds pretty ordinary so far, but near the end of the game, you side with Lucifer. The Prince of Darkness' aim is to free the demons residing in the Abyss. That is to say, gods from other religions banished from Yahweh's celestial realm once he became the dominant god of the world. Sort of a bait and switch, but one that's interesting. The concept is thought provoking, and even one that's revisited in the series later, but it's difficult to get a grasp on the ideology of chaos itself. Does it aim to destroy order and pave a way of human strength conquering all, or is it a unification of the old world's gods to topple the dictatorship of Yahweh? One could say they both share the same ideal to a degree, but the real ending would result in human subjugation unquestionably. Lucifer promises to give humans a degree of freedom, but then goes on to say that only the strong and beautiful will survive and reproduce, and the cycle of death and rebirth will continue forever. No safety is guaranteed, but nature is sure to take its course. Neutral is a compromise between the other two ideologies. Law's kingdom has great aspects, but living under God's iron rule and swearing unquestioning faith in him goes against many people's need for freedom. Chaos's world may seem exciting, as returning back to a primal time of true freedom would give rise to many great individuals willing to do anything for their goals. The world would inevitably lead to innumerable conflicts. Death and destruction would be the norm as ideologies clashed and only one would come out on top, and even then, only for so long. One must not try to pursue either extreme, as in the end, it will only produce sorrow. Beating back the extremes of law and chaos is imperative to ensure true happiness for humanity. SMT1 has a clear neutral bias, but not to such a degree that I couldn't see someone going for either other ending. I personally view Law as the most ideal outcome for the world. Go figure. The first Shin Megami Tensei game sets a great precedent for the alignment system, but sadly is the only one in the series where I like all the endings. SMT2 Law has the Messians again. The canonical ending of SMT1 is neutral. However, the Messians rally their forces, perform a hostile takeover of the country, and establish a theocracy. Law is a draconic, almost insane belief of subservience to a god filled with nothing but hatred for his creations. Spurning all life, the Messians aim to destroy any who do not worship Yahweh. That isn't the ending, however. Well, kind of. The real law ending is inciting with a character named Zayin, who is in great opposition to the current Messian regime and speaks out after learning the truth behind their heinous actions. 
Seems good so far, but eventually Zayn is revealed to be none other than Satan, created by fusing Zayn with Seth, claiming he finally understands who he really is and his true purpose. As Satan, the agent of Yahweh's vengeance, he accompanies the player to the Grand Cathedral and fights off everyone and everything that gets in your way. Eventually, you make your way to the Megiddo Ark, a machine designed to go into outer space and destroy all life on Earth. When you finally confront Yahweh, you and Satan end up killing him, as he himself is most guilty of causing suffering for his people. Sounds amazing, but after you kill Yahweh, what do you do? You pull the switch and kill everyone on Earth anyway, of course. It doesn't matter that it goes against everything Zayn believed in, and probably everything you believe in as well. You do it anyway. This completely invalidates the decisions you've made leading up to this point, and destroys Zayn as a character, both literally and figuratively. Chaos is a surprisingly reactionary alignment, with their only goal being to fight back against Yahweh's destruction of the world. Seeing the destruction wrought by the Messians, you engage in attacks on their facilities and make your way into the Abyss itself. The Abyss is a place where the gods of other religions were banished to when Yahweh took the Celestial Throne and threw them out to become the dominantly worshipped deity. After defeating the Archangels, misguided by a fake Yahweh, you meet the ruler of the Abyss, the fallen angel Lucifer. The Prince of Hell sings your praises and explains that he wishes to prevent Yahweh's destruction of the world, in turn saving the Abyss. Together, you fight against incredible odds, destroy the Megiddo Ark, and save the world as we know it. Along with this, Lucifer frees the inhabitants of the Abyss and allows the myriad gods of the world to roam free once more without the oppression of Yahweh. The mutants of the underground are also free from the oppression of the messians. This game portrays chaos as an almost objective good ending, as it's an underdog story where you get to free the gods and create a new world for everyone, physical and spiritual. Neutral is once again a middle ground between the other two, where you fight against the forces of law and chaos. There is nothing for humans to cling to in times of trouble. This is a world destroyed, but a world where humans alone can rule. Despite this, as long as there are people who wish for salvation outside of humanity's capabilities, the will of the universe will bring Yahweh back. All in all, the chaos bias with this game is incredibly evident. I hear it was due to the English translation that chaos is so obviously the most appealing ending, but looking at the events of the game, it would be pretty hard to justify any other ending being better for humanity. The law ending essentially destroys the vast majority of the world to start anew with a chosen few, completely destroying the nuance law had in SMT1. Neutral is delaying the inevitable, as it is confirmed by Yahweh that humans will always seek guidance from a higher power, and from that wish, he will return. Chaos is the only outcome where humans from all walks of life can be free, while also having a guiding force with the freedom to choose your affiliation. Much like SMT1, conflict will be inevitable but there will be a ruler in Lucifer and possibly Aleph to keep order. SMT3 Nocturne For this game, I'll be treating all reasons to be law, freedom and demon to be neutral, and true demon ending to be chaos. If all reasons are law, then honestly, it's portrayed very well. As a set of traditions and beliefs a world will abide by for the greater good of the people. Hikawa Shijima is the reason that springs to mind immediately as what most people would interpret as law, with the world of stillness a kingdom that will flourish in the silence of time. This is the ending I would think most people would be against. I understand the ideal to eradicate all hatred, war, and strife, but ridding humans of all their ambition and seemingly their individuality is a steep price to pay. Humanity is terrible at points, but becoming a hive mind simply working towards the ambiguous goal of progress is crazy. Chiaki's Yosuga reason is a pretty stereotypical chaos survival of the fittest ending, with the twist of most of the demons following her being angels, this is an interesting take on law, as in SMT, it explains that Yahweh was not the original creator of the universe, but rather the strongest force within it. Thanks to his strength, he banished all the other gods to the abyss and became the Almighty. Sounds pretty chaotic to me. It stands to reason that the angels would have faith that in a world where might makes right, Yahweh would win again. Isamu's Musubi reason is a world of isolation. Everyone is their own Yahweh in this ending, and it's in my opinion, the truest essence of law a world that adheres to the creator's divine will with strict laws and rules. The chaos ending in Nocturne is called the true demon ending, the ending where you heed Lucifer's call and break the cycle of death and rebirth by killing everything. This ending was only added after the Maniacs edition of the game, and you can tell they put a ton of effort into it. Nocturne was an amazing game already, then they pumped tons more content into it and by far the most involved ending. Throughout the entire Amala Network dungeon, it makes Lucifer out to be a very wise and cunning entity. 
Most people crave closure, and in almost every alignment ending in SMT, they make it a point to say the cycle will never end. The true demon ending fills that need for people to feel as though they made a permanent impact on the world. In doing so, you kill all your friends, destroy the world's ability to recreate itself, and become Lucifer's general to destroy Yahweh on his throne. Without the worship of living creatures, you have a good shot at taking down Yahweh permanently this time. In truth, what is more chaotic than destroying the very fabric of reality and the rules the universe abides by? Reigning chaos, heaping death upon death, becoming the most powerful being in the universe. I'm a law advocate, and even I have to admit, I prefer this ending hands down. The neutral endings of Nocturne consist of Demon and Freedom endings. Demon is a more poetic take on neutrality. Where once in the series there was a belief that neutrality was the ideal, in Nocturne it's portrayed as apathy and ignorance. A body brimming with strength, but with an empty soul. The inability to choose even though your power could sway the creation of a new world is not something worth rewarding. You are stuck in a world with no chance of recreating itself. But not a finale, simply a planet-sized waiting room. Kagatsuchi explains how he will have to wait for the next opportunity to change the world, and even if you kill him, nothing changes. At least Lucifer shows up again to offer you his blessing, but then he promptly leaves. In the ending dialogue, Lucifer says the world will have chaos reign, but I would consider this a more neutral ending due to the fact the requirements to get it are not choosing a side, much like the more obvious neutral ending, freedom. Speaking of freedom, this is the reason of Yuko, a world with no set future. The freedom the great will gave humanity led them to great heights, but also destruction. If you are willing to go back to the way the world once was, let no one, not even the great will, tell you you can't reshape the world. This is an ending I've thought a lot about, and decided it's a profoundly hopeful ending. Where once, I thought this was a cosmic snooze button due to the text at the very end saying, In time, your true adversary will appear before you. Until then, stay strong. Now, I believe it to be the essence of the neutral alignment. To get this ending, you must disregard all that was told to you about the creation of the world. The entire game, you're told you lost your humanity, and yet you are not a true demon. You cannot reshape the world as you are, and you must choose. To pick this ending is to say no to the lies you were told, and take the world you want by any means necessary, regardless of anyone's rules. The forces of law, the forces of chaos, and even the forces of the world be damned. I love it. With all the endings out of the way, chaos is clearly biased. Due to the Maniac's port adding so much surrounding it, the ending is by far the one with the most closure, not to mention content. In the original game, by virtue of them wanting to do something different, one could argue that they have a neutral bias, but not to such an obvious degree. When you think of SMT Nocturne, you think of the true demon ending. The endings of the base game all share an air of anticlimax, as understanding the cycle of death and rebirth of worlds is integral to the plot. This entire journey will be a blip on the cosmic timeline of events, unless you think outside of the box and tear away the rules of the universe. Doing so will strip you of any and all humanity you have left. But there's no such thing as humanity anymore, so who cares? SMT Strange Journey For the sake of discussion, I will lightly cover both original and redux endings for the Strange Journey segment. Law in the original is one of my favorite alignments, with Zelenin and Mastema being some of the most interesting characters in SMT as a whole. Except, not anymore. I'll elaborate more on that later. When you're on the law path, you along with Zelenin achieve incredible heights, and Zelenin even ascends to becoming an angel. Mastema wishes to usher in the Thousand Year Kingdom, much like the Messians in SMT1, but with something a bit more impactful. Complete subjugation and suppression of humanity's will to force adherence to God's word. Much like the other games, throughout the story you're faced with moral choices. The law-aligned decisions make a lot of sense and lead up to the ending well. Such as when faced against Jack's crew, an antagonistic force in the Schwarzveld, the law-aligned solution is to pacify them by stripping them of their ambition through the angelic hymns of Zelenin. The choice to give up aspects of your humanity for the greater good while also retaining your soul and personality is the goal of law. In the ending, the force of law chose the pious to spread the word of God and returned those clung to their greed back to shapeless form. Whatever that means. Humans are freed from demonic ambition, as well as human ambition, and live in perfect harmony with one another and seek nothing past salvation. A peaceful world, but a stagnant one. The new law additions in Redux have Alex come back from the future, when humans who were not impacted by Zelenin's song were rounded up and killed. With a little deliberation, a new outcome was proposed, where humans are only stripped of demonic ambition, and do not have to adhere to God's rule. By doing this, humanity reaches utopia, and I hate it. 
The Redux law ending has Zelenin go against Mastema and he curses humanity for turning their backs on God. With the new ending, even Law portrays Yahweh as evil and nothing but a detriment to society. There is no downside to turning your back on God, and in fact, it's the best thing to do for humanity. This is a trend started back in SMT2 and will go strong into the later games. Yahweh is consistently portrayed as evil. Chaos in Strange Journey is represented by the series' second favorite Chaos Boy, Jimenez. When you're on the Chaos Path, Jimenez slowly begins to change his philosophy. From the beginning crash into the Schwarzfeld, his only aim is to escape. But as the story progresses and he bears witness to the demonic invasion, he does something strange. Jimenez begins to relate to the demons, viewing them not as evil and even seeing them as having a way of life preferable to humanities. Jimenez was a soldier before the mission, a warrant officer to be exact, so he's no stranger to war and he even makes his living from it. His strange mix of compassion for demons and belief that strength can overcome all problems leads him to his ideal world. After fusing with the demon Bugaboo, he aims to create a world of chaos, pulsing with the power and freedom of humans and demons alike. The ending has human civilization wiped away, and it seems as though most of humanity is purged as demons work to regain their godly forms. An insane ending that essentially spells the doom of humanity as we know it, and would lead to the end of progress towards anything besides killing each other. It might make sense why Jimenez would want it, but the world is doomed to eternal bloodshed. In the Redux editions, Alex comes back to express the truth of the new world. Turns out, it was worse than I already thought. Humans don't even work together, as she says that you have to prove your strength to everyone, and death is an everyday occurrence. A new outcome is proposed after Jimenez realizes that not everyone that dies deserves it. Sympathy does deserve a place in a human's heart, and the ability to kill shouldn't be the only deciding factor in decision making. Pretty crazy this had to be explained to him, but oh well. After a great cataclysm wiping away civilization, demons and humans live alongside each other, with demons acting as guardians. Nothing restricts humanity from freedom, and the many gods regain their power. The chaos ending goes from a pretty standard survival of the fittest to striving for freedom and cohabitation with demons, much like SMT2, a desirable outcome benefiting most of humanity. Neutral is an ending completely centered on humans. It aims to beat back the forces of law and chaos in the same vein as SMT1 and 2. With the help of the reanimated Commander Gore, the crew is set on a path where humans can attain freedom outside the realm of gods and demons to work towards true prosperity. Before fading away, Ubergestalt Gore imbues the main character with his power and tells them how to bring down the Schwarzfeld. To destroy it, Arthur will die, your helpful robot leader. But the sacrifice will hopefully be worth it. The ultimate goal and hope of this ending is that humanity takes what they learn from this experience along with the power bestowed by the Ubergestalt to prevent the need for the Schwarzfeld. If humanity never exceeds the limits of Earth and becomes too sinful, the planet will not require a purge. The Redux edition recontextualizes the original neutral ending, with the main character becoming a godlike guardian of humanity. This new ending outright says that humanity cannot and will not learn from their mistakes. The game ends with the main character's seventh time saving the world, with presumably several hundreds of years passing. The final shot being Arthur asking the player, Do you still feel human? Two completely opposite endings, and yet they still have the same belief at their very core. Humanity always deserves another chance. After brushing up on the endings of this game, it seems like... There is no bias? It seems like this is the first mainline game in the series with no bias. Even with the addition of the Redux endings, I can still see the pros and cons of every choice. The original, one could argue, has a neutral bias, as the fate of humanity is left ambiguous in an immediate sense. With Redux, they restructure the themes of each ending and make them all equally viable to a degree. I much prefer the original DS Strange Journey as a game, but for the sake of argument, we'll say that Strange Journey portrays each ending equally well. SMT4 Law is portrayed as an other, out to literally destroy with prejudice all indigenous people of Tokyo and set up a new world order for the chosen few. Initially, Law can be interpreted as an end goal of a separate kingdom outside the main world under God's rule. As the game progresses and the Black Samurai taints the sanctity of Mikado's citizens and caste system, the angels are spurred into action. Jonathan, our resident Law representative, is written to hammer home the unwavering adherence to authority Law is often associated with. Blind faith is definitely an aspect of law worth exploring, but as the story progresses, it gets less believable. Eventually, when Mikado is under the direct control of the Archangels and Yahweh, the obvious brainwashing is apparent. And seemingly, it's against the people's wills. 
Law is completely portrayed as the powers that be using Flynn as a pawn and the end goal being very similar to the Thousand Year Kingdom but without any of the implied upsides. The citizens of Mikado are ruled by fear and at the end of it all, the entirety of Tokyo, along with Merkaba, the literal chariot of God, is destroyed in a black hole. It's outright stated that anything that even touches those deemed unclean by God is to be annihilated. There is no attempt to convert the people of Tokyo to the belief system of Mikado. There is only complete genocide. This is the worst depiction of law in SMT so far. Completely unbelievable for anyone to choose this. I love the characters of SMT4, and I enjoyed law up until the alignment lock, which is a pretty insidious bait and switch. Unjustifiable and almost completely evil in every conceivable way. Chaos in SMT4 is the obvious good choice. Kind of. Walter is the resident Chaos representative of this game, and initially is an amazing character that easily garners sympathy from the player. In Mikado, there is a strict class system of luxurers and casualries where there is a clear gap in quality of life. Casualries are general laborers who work to keep the kingdom running through things like agriculture and construction. Luxurers are born into nobility and are the governing body that hold the vast amount of authority through the government and church. Walter is portrayed as the true underdog due to his unwillingness to accept the clear classism in his kingdom, and he stays true to his philosophy entering Tokyo as well. He deeply respects the people of Tokyo for fighting tooth and nail to stay alive and help each other. Walter accepts the Black Samurai, even after her turning into Lilith, for aiming to educate the general public of Mikado and work to tear down the main force in Tokyo, being Tayama. Tayama is what you could consider the law of Tokyo, but he literally scoops out children's brain matter to feed to demons. I guess that would be dark law on the alignment chart. Pretty despicable if you ask me. Once again though, this game pulls another bait and switch, where after the alignment lock, Chaos pivots from a freedom-fighting anti-classism war to a hostile takeover of Mikado where you flood the land with demons. Lucifer even tells you that in the world you created, the sons of men will only kill each other with their freedom. What they really want is a new king. We can only hope that Flynn is better suited to rule than any other. Neutral is portrayed once again as a middle ground between the other two extreme ideologies. If you exhibit unwillingness to fully support either extreme, along with an exorbitant amount of side questing, you can bring the two worlds of Tokyo and Mikado together in a spectacular way. Izubo, this game's neutral representative, relates to the people of Tokyo, yet holds love for the people of Mikado as a luxurer herself. Together, you work tirelessly to find a way to bring the two nations together and end up having to overcome the forces of law and chaos. Pretty standard for neutral at this point. After obtaining the Sword of Masakado, the Guardian of Tokyo, you transport the people of Mikado to the newly emancipated land of Tokyo to start a new life of coexistence. This destroys the kingdom of Mikado, but is a small price to pay for preventing the loss of so much more potential life and the bright future ahead of them. SMT4 quite obviously has a neutral bias. The ending has the highest quality of life for both sides of the conflict and the least amount of innocent blood spilled. Bringing back the status quo isn't the end goal of SMT4's neutral. In fact, its only goal is peace. This is so objectively the best option it almost hurts. I would think less of it if it wasn't so rewarding to get. Like I said before, the characters of Jonathan, Walter, and Izabo are fantastic, but for the sake of this argument, all I'm taking into account is the end goal of their alignment endings. The white ending is disqualified due to this, so sorry about that. The law ending literally has angels bursting out of beehives to allude to them being drones and chaos ends on a shot of Mikado burning down and Lucifer telling you you need to rule over humans anyway. Neutral just makes the most sense. SMT5 This is where things get... complicated. Law in the newest edition of SMT is hard to pinpoint. Yahweh is dead, but his angels remain to enact his will. His will being the preservation of humans and the banning of Nahobino. Nahobino being a means by which demons fuse with a human that carries the individual god's soul and ascend to a power rivaling Yahweh to take the Empyrean throne and rule the world. Yahweh's realm presumably was running smoothly up until Lucifer ended his life. The angels vehemently deny Yahweh's passing and fight as though he were still alive, including Abdiel who, along with Dazai, are this game's law representatives. Law's end goal is to reinstate God's rule over earth and banish demons, which makes sense. What actually ends up happening is Dazai fuses with Abdiel, breaking Yahweh's edict against Nahobinos, and then she immediately dies. Sounds pretty ridiculous when you just outright say it like that, but this ends up happening with each representative in almost every ending. 
It's especially egregious in the law ending, however, because they make a big point to show the severity of the decision Abdiel comes to by fusing with Dazai to become a fallen angel Nahobino. Dazai's descent into fully embracing God's importance and maybe going crazy is also a main plot point that they really do nothing with. Law in SMT5 is portrayed as a strict dogma of contradictory ideas that inevitably lead to destruction. The ending proper is surprisingly good, despite all the weird story decisions made throughout the game. The player reinstates Yahweh's old rule, creates a new Tokyo, and brings back almost every life lost in the conflict. With the majority of the story being underwhelming, but the ending being fairly good, I really don't know how to feel about this. Becoming God is a pretty enticing reward for going this route, but I can't say it was built up very well. Chaos is portrayed very similarly to the way it's portrayed in SMT2, that being that the aim is to emancipate the gods of other religions from banishment at Yahweh's hands. Initially, it's the most understandable alignment to choose. The knowledge of Yahweh's death is stated to the player extremely early, and teaming up with the angels is simply something the player has no choice in. The moment Koshimizu and Yuzuru express their aim to disband from Bethel, there is very little reason to go against their plan, aside from maybe your new friend Dazai. Tao dies pretty early on, and no one really seems to care about it that much, so I doubt they really had that tight of a bond. The aim to bring back the world before Yahweh's takeover of the heavens would be interesting, but thinking about the concept of Nahobino, it changes things. Considering every god has vastly different domains, personalities, and goals, fusing with humans to create a physical form to carry out their will with godlike strength would be very... problematic. They outright say many people will find life extremely difficult, and the irreconcilable differences between gods will lead to constant war and bloodshed. The narration leaves very little opportunity to consider this ending even kind of good, so in a way, it's the opposite of this game's law ending. A bait and switch much like Chaos in SMT4, but this time at the very end, which makes it more upsetting. Neutral in SMT5 comes in two flavors, regular and secret. For the regular neutral, you come across Nua and Yakumo who convey extremely chaos-like views. Yakumo constantly explains how humans must fight, and those without the will to fight should be dead. Nua sees some potential in the player, and the pair express their discontent with you remaining a pawn of Bethel. Slowly, Yakumo begins to express his true belief system. Humanity and humanity alone should survive by any means necessary. Never trust demons, whether they claim to have humanity's best interest in mind or not. Demons are to be eradicated, and not put on a pedestal to be worshipped. Yakumo justifies this by saying demons have never made a human's life easier, and they are a blot on this earth to be stamped out. If you resonate with any of these ideals, the player can decide to destroy the throne of God, the Empyrean, to prevent any god or demon from vying for the power to rule the world ever again. Many people got the chaos and neutral endings mixed up in this game, but to those who are experienced with SMT's general ideas towards neutral and chaos, this was fairly obvious. Chaos wishes to emancipate the demons banished by Yahweh, and Neutral aims to beat back the forces of Law and Chaos. It just so happens that the forces of Chaos are fought back off-screen. This is my personal favorite ending of the game. SMT5's secret ending is a variety of Neutral that is much more passive. In doing a series of side quests throughout the game, whose link to the actual ending is tenuous at best, you can achieve the goals of the original Neutral. By finishing Konsu's questline, Amanazako's questline, Finn McCool's questline, and Shiva's questline, you can decide to erase them all from existence. For this neutral ending, instead of destroying the Empyrean to prevent another hostile demonic takeover, you can assume the Empyrean yourself and simply will all demons and gods to cease existing forever. This ending ostensibly achieves the same goal as the neutral ending, but without any of the bloodshed. While this ending might seem like an objective improvement to the basic neutral ending, the world presumably is reverted back to before the demon attack. There's no change in human mindset, but there is nothing to any religion or mythology anymore. There are no revelations to prophets, no deliverance of the faithful, no judgment of evil, nothing. The earth will simply go on without interference until the heat death of the universe. That is, if humans don't end the world themselves before that. The ending gives me a profound feeling of emptiness and finality, which I suppose is what they were going for, but it just seems so hollow. SMT5 has an interesting way of portraying their alignments. The bias is hard to interpret, but there is one. The story, as it goes on, has a clear preference towards chaos, as Law is the group Bethel, which is a failing organization of gods who are constantly waiting for their opportunity to betray each other and claim power for themselves. The endings themselves are a different story. Law is my personal favorite, 
but Secret True Neutral is clearly the ending with the most involved lore connotations. It's the only ending that isn't just the narrator talking to you as you walk through space, the ending with the most involved requirements to get it, and the ending with the highest degree of finality to it. That covers every single alignment ending in all current mainline SMT games, aside from SMT9. With all that out of the way, let's finally answer the question posed in the intro. SMT1 has a neutral bias. SMT2 has a chaos bias. SMT3 has a chaos bias. SMT Strange Journey has no bias. SMT4 has a neutral bias. And SMT5 has a neutral bias. A grand total of 3 out of the 6 games have neutral biases. Not as bad as I thought, but here's where we get to the real point of the video. We now have to talk about the endings that are clearly the bad endings, or at least portrayed poorly. SMT1's worst alignment is Chaos. SMT2's worst alignment is Law. SMT3's worst alignments are Law. SMT Strange Journey's worst alignment is Chaos. SMT4's worst alignment is Law. And SMT5's worst alignment is Law. Four out of the six mainline SMT games' worst alignments are Law. That is a staggering amount of times Law is portrayed in a negative light. The common thread in most of these negative portrayals is Yahweh himself. Yahweh is consistently portrayed as a being with nothing but hate and a lack of respect for the human race. After realizing SMT's propensity to portray Law and specifically Yahweh as evil, I had no idea why they view the Abrahamic God in such a negative light. I wanted to know more, so I asked someone who might give me a better understanding of the topic. So the Western religions of Catholicism and Christianity have had quite the history in Japan. And it's quite a tragic one at that. And by the way, I do want to throw out a disclaimer that I'm aware this can be a sensitive topic for a whole variety of reasons. I don't want to diminish any hurt any of you may have experienced at the hands of those who claim the Christian faith, yet at the same time, I also don't want to diminish the hurt that was perpetrated towards believers in Christ. And so with that said, I'll be discussing the persecution of Christians in Japan's history, and how that's helped shape the current landscape of the country where only 1% of the total population identifies as Christian. I just think this is especially important to understand in SMT5's case, since I find that its endings share many parallels with the history of Christianity in Japan. So Catholicism first landed on the islands in 1549 via Portuguese missionaries during a very turbulent time in Japan's history. You see, hundreds of feudal lords called daimyo were embroiled in a war for power during what would come to be known as the Sengoku era. In the following decades since Catholicism's first introduction, as many as 15 of these lords, mostly located in the western half of Japan, converted to Christianity. And not only that, but the religion also did well among the poor. So in general, Christianity was allowed to thrive and prosper for a time while everyone was busy fighting each other. However, that all changed in 1587, when the coalition of three powerful figures, Oda Nobunaga, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, and Tokugawa Ieyasu, finally succeeded in their campaign to reunify the entirety of Japan under one central government. This meant that with the war finally over, the new government could now set its sights on any perceived threats to the new budding nation, one of these threats being the growing number of Christian converts. The fact that Catholicism was an organized religion was enough to trouble the new government, since the militant Buddhist sect known as the Ito Iki caused much trouble for Toyotomi and Tokugawa during their initial campaign to reunify Japan. Furthermore, it came to their attention in 1596 that some of these western nations would send missionaries in the lead up to them launching their own conquest of these territories. So taking extra precaution to squash any budding religion that could potentially take up arms, and also in hopes of defending Japan from foreign powers in general, 
the new government issued the first executions of Christian missionaries and converts in 1596. This persecution continued sporadically in the decades following, until finally in 1614, the Tokugawa shogunate officially banned Catholicism, while in the meantime established Buddhism as the official religion of Japan. The temple guarantee system went into effect at this time, which required all people to produce a certificate of affiliation with a Buddhist temple. Now, it should be noted that Tokugawa didn't utilize these temples out of any particular faithfulness to Buddhism, but to simply squash out the threat of Christianity, all while honoring the ways of Japan's heritage, since Buddhism, on top of Shintoism, are the two cornerstones of Japanese mythology. But going back to the persecution of Christians, the Tokugawa shogunate produced these things called fumie, which were items depicting the images of the Virgin Mary and Christ, all with the sole purpose to be trod upon. You see, the policy of the Tokugawa shogunate was to have these fresh converts renounce their faith so that eventually there would be no more practicing Christians in Japan. Anyone who was reluctant to trod on the fumie was sent to Nagasaki for further torture, and if they still did not turn from their Christian beliefs, then they were sent to Mount Unzen for execution. The overall ban on Christianity continued from 1614 all the way to 1873, but by the time it was lifted, the narrative had essentially already been set. By that, I mean that Catholicism slash Christianity was so firmly tied with danger and the distrust of foreigners for so many centuries that there was really no way for the faith to gain a footing on the island nation ever again. To this day, less than 1% of Japanese people identify as Christian. Now, this is a topic that always hit close to home as someone who has grown up in the Japanese-American Protestant community my entire life. Though I've personally never agreed with their mostly fundamentalist interpretation, i.e. what evangelical Christianity is largely based on. My mother was a native-born Japanese woman who came to know Christ's teachings from my father, a Japanese-American who taught English in Japan for three years. It's the real compassion and non-judgmental attitudes of my parents towards every person, regardless of their gender or sexual orientation, race, and or other background, that has always stuck with me. And for us, it has always been guided by a Christ's teachings and the study of the Bible in its historical context and all that has always been and continues to be a big part of my life. A lot of people from the community I've grown up in have served as missionaries in Japan for many years now, but still the reaction to the small church communities established are normally viewed with suspicion or just completely ignored. Now, this is understandable to me, considering Japan's huge history with homegrown cults, but that's a topic for another time. It just makes me kinda sad on a personal level that there's so much skepticism towards Christianity in the country. But back to the topic of SNT5, when it comes to the endings, I can't help but notice how they fit the narrative regarding religion in Japan as a result of the Tokugawa shogunate. What with Tsukuyomi and the other Japanese gods eventually coming to view Abdiel and Bethel as outsiders who don't have Tokyo's best interests in mind. And so, speaking of all the endings, I have to say that the Chaos one weird how it's labeled that, by the way, resonated with me most out of the four possible. Also, I should preface this part that in any given medium, I'm very much biased towards humans. I think that's referred to as being anthropocentric? 
So, in other words, humanity's potential to be okay slash relatively at peace without fallible autocrats governing them is normally the most important part in any ending to me. So that essentially disqualifies law and neutral endings and leaves just chaos for the fourth ending. Now, I was having a hard time deciding how to feel about that hidden ending, especially since it seemed so weirdly removed from the themes of the game's side quests, but I was talking with Tony and he brought up a really great point that I never thought of before, and that was how the removal of all the supernatural demon side of things meant there was really no point to anyone's spirituality or faith. In other words, there would still be people who believed in a wide variety of gods, fairies, or demons, but there would be no actual connection with that side at all. And since I consider myself a follower of Christ whose spirituality has helped get me through the toughest times in my whole life, the reality of this ending just seems so profoundly sad. So in the end, the chaos ending seems the fairest to all parties to me. Especially since the side quests all game tried to sell this point that not all demons are bad. So I feel like this ending allows the good demons to choose a side for themselves. And though there would surely be many human casualties as they try to find a way to fight back, at least society wouldn't be beholden to one of the flawed orders a la law or neutral routes. But I've hogged enough time in this video by this point, so I just want to give a big thanks to Tony once again for letting me have this opportunity to talk about this topic with you guys, and now I'm passing it back to him. The perception of Abrahamic religion in Megaton is a product of the culture surrounding the region it's made in. It's impossible to strip away that aspect of it, but when it becomes so easy to see the biases, it becomes a problem. Having a twist where the organized religion has a dark underbelly is fine. Having a government use religion as a guise to rule over the populace is fine. Examples of this can be seen in real life as well and can make for an excellent tale. In Shin Megami Tensei, however, consistently portraying Yahweh, who shares the same name as the real-life Abrahamic god, as an evil tyrant who cares nothing for humans is getting tiring. To be clear, I'm not implying that the Abrahamic god of real life and Yahweh of SMT are interchangeable. Of course they aren't, this is a video game with its own lore, but to say that they aren't obviously drawing parallels would be disingenuous. Moral ambiguity in story choices has always been the appeal of Shin Megami Tensei. This is the only series where you can shape the world in almost every single game by the end. Having a big bad evil guy is okay in other RPGs, but in SMT I expect more. I expect better. Yahweh being portrayed as an evil, mind-controlling tyrant is cliché, tired, and doesn't often lend itself to good storytelling. Spending the entirety of the game saving people and being kind, regardless of who they are, like in the choices of SMT2 in sparing Daylith's life, or in SMT4 in the Colosseums, and even sparing the Dullahan, only to kill everyone in the law endings anyway, is just silly. All because law drones doing genocide is a meme. People generally tend to steer towards the law-like choices in these games, but when the real alignment defining choices rear their ugly head, no one in their right mind would choose some of the options given. I love Shin Megami Tensei. It's probably my favorite series ever, so that's why I expect better from it. A game where you can recruit and fight alongside gods and demons from every world religion, demonology, and regional folktales, all while shaping the world to align to your beliefs out of nothing but sheer determination and force of will is truly something special. Having a story like, the guy in charge is actually really evil and wants to kill everyone for no reason, is not what I want. Having a story like, don't you think having no personality or freedom is a good idea, is not what I want. I want more law representations like Strange Journey, more nuance, more interesting moral dilemmas, and less one-dimensional antagonists. I believe Atlas can do it. Here's hoping for a great Shin Megami Tensei 6. Special thanks to AutoShift, Frankie Stoned, Heavenly Potato, John, Mr. Eight Eyes, Nexta666, VideoGamer75, and many others for supporting the channel on Patreon. If you'd like to support, check the link in the description below. And as always, thanks for watching this Tony for you. Have a good one.